So, essentials of composition in outdoor photography. Now, you'll hopefully remember quite a lot of this, but um, I'm going to uh, going to run through it again. Um, so, making a start. Um, why do we need to think about composition? Learn how to make your images catch the eye, draw, draw attention to your subject, and learn how to create what looks right. Um, it's quite ill-defined in that respect, but it's very much about um, making your images stand out, making people look at your work rather than thinking, it looks a bit flat. What is it about a picture that, people, that grabs people's eyes? So hopefully this will uh, give you a few pointers to that. Uh, the picture in the screen there is uh, Manowar Bay in the Jurassic Coast. You can see that um, effectively the landscape pattern, the landscape shape has drawn your eye into the picture, leading to uh, the sun in, in the background. Um, as I mentioned to you last week, uh, that was very much by chance. I didn't actually plan that. The sun just happened to be exactly in the right place. Um, so what this composition, in, uh, the, this presentation includes, uh, why do we need to think about it? Um, subject matter is very diverse. There's lots of subjects involved. Uh, so I'm going to run through a few examples of the kind of subjects that you might, you might want to be thinking about photographing. Uh, key things about composition, your point of view is number one, and understanding scale perspective and the use of your lenses, which I need to change that around because I think as last week, I got those the other way around. Um, so perspective and use of your lenses is key. And your point of view is precisely where you're holding the camera, whether it's high up, low down, left, right, whatever it is. And the key thing is with many compositions, a little bit of difference in your point of view can make a, a very substantial difference to your, to your picture. Uh, so I'm going to be running through that. Uh, compositional guidelines. Um, key thing is not what they are, it's what they do. So all those compositional guidelines, which you'll be familiar with, uh, rule of thirds, using leading lines, using foreground, etc., are very much about what they do and what they aim to achieve. Because if you think about what they aim to achieve rather than what they are, you will tend not to use it for using its sake. You will use it because it achieves a certain effect. So I'm going to be running through on that basis and a few examples uh, at the end. So we're going to go through that as well. Um, I very much like those kind of pictures. The picture in the background there, which is ruined by all the writing. Uh, tree, little tree taken in Italy, uh, where it's just a, a small feature in the landscape, but it really catches the eye because it's, it's, it's just a very distinct feature with the light on it. So, uh, um, so my kind of picture, really. Running on to the next slide. Um, so choosing your subject, that particular one is uh, a bay on the Antrim coast in Northern Ireland. If you've not been to Northern Ireland, I know for many people in, in uh, the rest of the UK, it's actually quite, because it involves catching a ferry, it's a bit of a trek, but it's well worth going to the Antrim coast. It's a beautiful part of the world. I'll definitely go back. That was taken over New, over New Year. Uh, so, um, what are our subjects? Uh, can be planned. So you might have a, a subject in mind that you've been to before. And you've seen in a certain light, but you think, ah, I didn't quite get it at its best. Or you uh, um, chance upon something and you think, I need to get a good picture of that. So um, planned uh, subjects, subjects where you think, right, the light's right. I'm going to have a go at photographing it. Um, so a um, few examples here, one of which is my favorite, one of my favorite views in the Brecon Beacons, Alien Donan Castle and a local bluebell wood. Um, so we might plan to take pictures. Conversely, they might be spontaneous. You're just out for a walk, out with a camera, out somewhere, got out of the car, passed, whatever, and you've spotted something which catches your eye. So these tend to be more individual than the planned pictures because the planned pictures would tend to have a subject where the subject matter has caught your eye. Uh, whereas these would tend to be ones which happen to be a moment of light which have come and gone, or as with the case of the pony, a, 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 a certain standing in position. That moment's going to, it's not going to be there when you come back again. So, um, so they tend to be more spontaneous. And I far prefer these kind of pictures to the, to the planned ones because they tend to be more individual to me. Whereas anybody in truth 
albeit with different light, can go back to the same spot and effectively replicate what you've uh, what you've what you've previously taken. Um, choosing a subject, well, it may have a clear point of focus or feature. Uh, three pictures there. Uh, one is Battersea Power Station, enhanced very much by the uh, the, the, the lights on the cranes. Uh, a waterfall in the Brecon Beacons and a disused Slate Mill and Snowdonia, one of my favourite spots actually. Um, these tend to be planned on the basis that they are very much in a stiff, definite subject where you know the subject, they've got a very clear reason for being taken. So these tend to be planned pictures, albeit hoping to catch them in the kind of light that you're looking for or the kind of weather conditions that you're looking for. Um, so um, as I mentioned, clear focus, point of focus or, or feature. Conversely, these would tend to be more spontaneous Generic general views, which don't have a particular uh, reason for being taken um, um, or particular reason for going there in the first place, but you something that catches your eye. And that usually is light or something that's caught your eye. So these tend to be more spontaneous because they haven't got a distinct reason for being taken in the first place in some ways. So um, yeah, these tend to be more spontaneous. The one at the top right, Probably not a particularly good example, the one taken at Glencoe, because it is a fantastic backdrop, but certainly the snow and the frost certainly uh, enhance the effect. It's a, it's a, if you've not been to Glencoe, uh, just drive up with the A82 in northern Scotland, you can't miss it. It's a, a stunning place. Um, so, yeah, these tend to be of more of the spontaneous kind, but of course I'm talking very much gen generalities as well. Um, these, again, in some ways more spontaneous because they are a vignette, a small detail, something that's caught your eye and just made you pick up your camera and take a picture of it. Um, often more telephoto style pictures because they're more detail, more a small element of the landscape um, which, uh, which has caught your eye. So again, these tend to be more uh, individual, more spontaneous than the planned ones. And generally, most of my favorite pictures are not planned because they're unique to me. They're ones that I've captured and generally nobody else has got anything like them. So uh, that, 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 appeal, that very much appeals to me rather than the, I'm gonna to go to a place to take a picture from, plan it to death and hope to get the right light. Yes, of course, I and many of you have got pictures like that, we all do, but my favorites tend to be far more tend to be the spontaneous ones. So the next um, section in this is got two elements to it. Uh, scale and perspective and the use of your lenses and exploring your point of view. Um, firstly, scale, perspective and use of your lenses. Quite revealing this and pro people probably underestimate, oh, before I go on, uh, just mention what that picture is, uh, taken in Abruzzo in Italy, uh, where I bought a little place last year, uh, which is little, very little, um, and, uh, but it's actually uh, World War II ruins um, where the Germans overran the local village, uh, but fantastic moment of backlighting, and it's a really atmospheric place, a place called Jessapolina. Um, so, uh, moving on, um, You'll certainly remember this from last week. Uh, four pictures standing um, gradually further away from the arch, but intended to keep the arch roughly the same size in each picture. So starting off with a wide angle, standing close, gradually walking further back, and, and then zooming in with a telephoto. You can see the effect that the background has on the relationship of the foreground and background, it makes a huge difference to the effect of the picture. Now, this is obviously a theoretical exercise, uh, but you can see that relationship between foreground and background is huge. And when I took this, I was actually quite surprised at the difference in effect as, uh, as well. So, very different if you stand in the same spot and zoom in and out. So effectively, you're getting the same relationship between foreground and background. So that all I've done is bought, effectively brought the arch closer to me, I thought that brought the whole picture close to me. I could have cropped, albeit lose, lost a lot of resolution, cropped the 18 millimeter one and 
got to the 175 millimeter one. So it's effectively the same picture. So um, you can see what the difference is. Now, I know this is a theoretical situation, but of course, this has got huge implications on our, the effect in real life photography. So wide angle effect, big expansive foreground, often quite dramatic, um, use very, very strong perspective lines, very good for that. Very good for those big, bold, impressive foregrounds and receding into the distance. But use with caution um, because it's very easy to, when we've got a phot photograph in mind, we often have a potential subject. Um, a castle, a uh, monument, mountain, whatever it happens to be. And then you think, okay, you need a foreground in front of it but it's very easy to reach for the widest angle lens and forget about that relationship between foreground and background. And effectively your background is diminished into something very, very insignificant. So it's important to bear in mind the effect you want and that relationship between foreground and ground and background you want. Now, if you look at the one on the top right, not a very good picture, but I thought I'd include it because it illustrates a point. Um, the foreground is a rock with a, uh, I think it's heather on it. And the background is the whole of the Mont Blanc Massif. It's a huge mountain range, 20, 30 miles wide. It's massive. But all I've done effectively in using this foreground feature is simply diminishing into, into something which, which isn't particularly relevant in the shot. So there's no wrong or right about any of this because ultimately it's, it's our pictures. We do with them what we want and that relationship uh, is what we want. But it's important to be aware of it and think actually what is the effect I'm trying to achieve with this picture. If it's a, as the picture at the bottom, the perspective line shot, the one taken at uh, this Penarth Pier in South Wales, then I think the effect's right because it, 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 it emphasizes that dramatic perspective effect but it can go very wrong as well. We've also seen plenty of pictures of a famous castle with a big impressive foreground, but the castle's become something very insignificant in the background. Um, so, but, but wide angle lenses are good for, as I mentioned, strong perspective lines, big wide expansive views. You're catch, catching a sense of scale of drama, a big landscape, so big skies. Very good for big skies, of course, as well. Um, so um, I, I still use them a lot, but that relationship is key to, to whether it's, not whether it's successful or not, because these pictures with big foregrounds can be very impressive, but it's whether it's what you want or not from your image. Conversely, telephoto lenses, very different, two-dimensional flattening effect, where that relationship between foreground and background is massively different. So taken from a distance, taken from further back, zooming in with a lens of various, of various lengths. And of course, um, uh, you can shoot with a shorter lens, say, I don't know, 100, 200 millimeters, and crop, and you'll get the same effect, providing you haven't got any defocusing effect. But effectively, if everything's in focus, you, will, you can crop a 200 millimeter lens, crop 80% of the picture out, and you'll be equivalent to a 600 millimeter lens. But of course, you'll lose significant resolution. Um, so um, uh, I actually, quite a lot of my uh, longer shots, when I've wanted a smaller part of the picture, are actually cropped images. And generally, with a high resolution camera, nobody would really know. But the key thing is, if you want that flattening effect, that large foreground in relation sorry, small foreground, I beg your pardon, in relation to large background, then choose a telephoto effect. Very good for um, two-dimensional and, and uh, sometimes abstract images. Um, so other examples of telephoto pictures. So you'll see a very, very clear fat and flattening effect, very two-dimensional, very good for that kind of colored pattern, that sort of thing. And also something which we all underuse, and I certainly do, um, I think defocusing, uh, as the examples of the cows <laughs> to uh, to with their um, uh, backsides facing the camera and the one looking right di directly into me um, then uh, really particularly with the rim lighting um, really picks picks the uh, the cows out with the uh, out of focus background so it's something I, I always resolve to do a little bit, little bit more of in truth because it can be a use, useful asset which I, th I don't think many of us use enough um, so they're also, telephoto lenses are also very good for that receding tones effect. So if you've got a, a hazy or misty morning um, or, um, or 
or mist in the landscape, um, then a telephoto lens will create a series of receding planes or tones in your image, starting from dark towards the camera and then receding to lighter and lighter into the background. One of my favorites is possibly that one on the top right, it's taken on the Isle of Skye. Now most people, it's uh, the Quarang, and most people go to the Karang, 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 I beg your pardon, um, and photograph the well-known view of the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, Trottenish Ridge. But actually, you know, that's one of, probably one of my favorites with just a series of very simple receding tones taken with a 200 millimeter lens. I uh, never know whether to crop uh, the foreground lake out. I've actually got an example with the foreground lake cropped out. Whether I've made the right choice, I'm not sure. Um, so, receding tones of the telephoto lens. I've got, look, got quite a few of those pictures. A comparative example where when I was running a workshop, um, top one uh, taken with a longer lens about 80, 70 or 80 millimeters. Um, so it's very much focused the eye on the field pattern and the line of hedge, hedges running through the landscape uh, and the interlocking pattern of trees. The bottom ones, uh, top right's not a great shot, but uh, it illustrates the point, um, includes a foreground um, with that same view in the background. And uh, the uh, next one taken a little bit later on, um, uh, it tries to introduce a foreground receding lines, perspective lines picture into, into the landscape in the foreground, but it diminishes the impact of the field pattern. So um, as with all these things, no right or wrong about it. It depends what you want from your picture. To my mind, the key thing about that view was that pattern of trees, the interlocking pattern of hedges, trees and fields in the mist, which is far better captured with the use of a longer lens. Another, illustrate, another illustration here, uh, taken on the Isle of Skye, the usual shots that people take of uh, um, the Elgol coastline, uh, go down to the waterfront, uh, capture some rocks in the foreground and get the mountain, the Kulin Mountains, the backdrop. But you can see um, how much that relationship between foreground and background changes. Um, the one at the top, that foreground is there on the right hand side, so it's taken right back at the end of the bay. And that re relationship, it gives you much more of an impression of scale of the mountains uh, with one at the top compared to the one at the bottom. Now, I want photographically, because I took an awful lot more care over it, Visually, photographically, well, photographically, I'm sure you'll probably agree that the one on the bottom works better. But it does illustrate that relationship and how key that is to making sure you get the impression you want when you choose your lenses. Um, this one, uh, very subtle variation in the, in the picture, Glencoe, Glenative in Scotland. Uh, one taken from a little bit higher up, closer, uh, further away from the waterfall and one taken a little bit further down, getting a bit more impact on the waterfall in the foreground. Um, I happen to prefer the one on the left-hand side. I think that space between the waterfall and the background mountain um, works better. The one on the right feels a bit squeezed, in truth. And I, I prefer that relationship of, of uh, the feeling of depth and that relationship of the waterfall and the mountain with the one uh, at the bottom, uh, it, oh, sorry, on the left. Um, Compression of scale, very good. Telephoto lens is very good for that uh, compression uh, effect, two-dimensional pattern effect. So if you look for patterns, they're, they're very good for two reasons. One is because they're good at extracting detail and they focus on just an element, a small part of the picture. But secondly, they also compress, uh, compress the two, compress all the elements. Uh, so um, they're very selective. Very good for observation. Just go out with a telephoto lens and have a look and see what you can find. And finally on this, then um, bit, uh, pictures with a bit more color to it, um, but again, focusing on, on detail. Exploring your point of view is the uh, next section. Um, so, key things. Uh, a couple of examples from uh, Glencoe in Scotland. Um, your point of view. It's where you position yourself in relation to your subject uh, or subjects. And the key thing, particularly when you're using a wide angle lens that a slight difference in your point of view can make a, that should read make, not name, a big difference to the appearance of your image. Um, however, 
sometimes, of course, when you've got a distant view and a broad view, it makes little difference, particularly when the foreground is not a key element. Uh, so um, sometimes um, then with the shot on the bottom right, uh, then um, I would need to move an awful long way to make a big difference to the picture. It's very much a, sh a shot looking into the distance. Um, but the key thing is if you've got uh, using a telephoto lens, particularly, sorry, a wide angle lens, particularly with the, um, the foreground um, uh, close to the camera, then, then shifting a point of view can make a very big difference to the effect of your picture. A few examples here, take, all taken in Snowdonia, one a distant view um, looking uh, towards uh, the Snowdon range itself. Um, very much a distant view, uh, just captured that in a fleeting moment, uh, and half an hour li later, all the clouds were gone. Um, bottom one uh, on the left hand side, uh, when you're close to water, one for visual balance, but two for stillness of water, get as close to the water as possible. Um, so, again, with that, the little bit of difference in your point of view can make quite a big difference. And the same applies to the shot on the bottom right shot towards Triven, uh, where I've positioned the waterfall on the bottom left, Triven on the top right, uh, and shifting position will again sh move that, that shift of uh, that relationship between the two quite significantly. That compositional idea I use quite a lot with a feature in the bottom corner, one on one corner, often the left admittedly, uh, and a feature on the top right, I use that arrangement quite a lot and I find it adds a certain dynamism, a certain um, relate, clear relationship between one feature and another. These ones, they're very much snapshots, so uh, don't judge the photographic quality, but it just illustrates the uh, significance of uh, some movement in position. So the top one on the left, uh, I was standing uh, in front of the waterfall with the mountains behind, and then I gradually walked up the hill and kept effectively the waterfall virtually in the center of the frame. So it, it, it changes the relationship between the waterfall in the front and the mountains in the background, where it changes the emphasis into one looking towards the mountains and the others looking down, looking down the river. So it just illustrates that, uh, that change in position, a change of emphasis for your picture. Here's one taken in the, in the Lake District. Uh, make sure your uh, foreground doesn't interfere. Uh, it can be quite easy to introduce a foreground, but forget the fundamental reason why you took the picture in the first place. The reason why I wanted to take that picture was obviously dramatic light coming through dark clouds, lighting up the valley uh, uh, behind, behind. What you don't want to do is have a foreground which can potentially interfere with that. For that reason, for these kind of shots, I rarely have my foreground lit unless the foreground feature itself is a key element of the picture because it will distract, detract the, uh, the attention and take your eye away from the main reason you took the picture. Um, so the successful one in my mind was the one on the, the, bottom, the bottom right. Um, this one, just an illustration of the fact that a little bit more thought given the point of view, the view can make a big difference to the picture. Uh, first one, bit of a snap. Uh, canal uh, uh, daffodils on my canal bank on the other side uh, of my village. Um, second two, given a bit more thought. So top right, using a lower viewpoint, getting closer to the daffodils where the ride at wider angle, uh, turns the daffodils very much into bands of colour as opposed to individual flowers. So visually a much stronger effect. And the example at the bottom, backlighting, waiting till end of the day until the sun comes into the camera. Um, so uh, very different effects. So all it takes is a little bit more thought given to change a snap to something which is actually visually quite strong in very much an everyday scene, really. Other examples, um, one, of my, one of my favorite shots, some sunflowers in uh, Gower. Um, I chose a range of different examples of these. Now, a lot of them uh, have got, they're okay, they've got the sun in the background, flowers in the foreground, but nothing made them stand out. But the key thing about this one is the three sunflowers in the corner forming a curve. And it is actually another example of where I've used main feature in the bottom on the left and a feature, the sun in this case, drawing the eye to the top on the right. It's the same arrangement as that waterfall one. Um, so it is something I use quite a lot. Um, 
so uh, the square format worked quite well. I think the original one, the three by two format, you can see on the top left, not as successful. It doesn't really have that relationship between the sun and the flowers as strongly. So the crop, I think, I think works works better. Again, it's just about about experimenting. Next section is on, as I mentioned, on uh, right at the outset, uh, the essential ingredients of composition. Um, so all of these contain uh, what we know as familiar compositional rules, uh, using leading lines, um, using framing, uh, using foreground, using the thirds, these kind of things. But think about what they do, not, not what they are, because they're not always appropriate. They're not always going to give, the, give you the effect that they want. And in fact, they might take away or ruin the effect that you want. So think about what they achieve. So I've defined these in terms of what they do, not what they are. So what they do is draw attention to your subject, create depth or place a main feature and create space. That's what those compositional guidelines all do in composition. So just reinforcing um, the, uh, the point I was making just a minute ago. And you'll then think about when you might want to use them and when it's best not to. Uh, that picture, by the way, is the cropped version of the one without the lake. And I'm thinking it again. I think I prefer the one with the lake. There you go. Um, so drawing attention to your subject right at the start. We've all heard of using a, using a focal point. Your focal point is clearly the main reason why you took the picture, the key element within it. So it's something that catches your eye um, and um, very clear. So those pictures on the whole are very clear why they've, why they've been taken. They are a picture of a specific subject. A few more images of the Elian Donan one though, where, the, where I've used a foreground which has interfered with the subject. So think about how you use the foreground um, and whether it's appropriate or not, whether it adds to the composition or whether it interferes. In this case, I walk close to the, uh, the castle and it's a much clearer, cleaner uh, image. You'll notice that I've also added the, uh, the ones on the left are unprocessed raw files. So simply done a JPEG conversion of the original raw file without touching them. So you can see I've also added uh, um, a stronger color as well and tried to emphasize and replicate what, what I saw when I was originally there. So it has a, li a little bit of a tweak as well. One on the bottom right is a square crop. Now I like square crops. In this occasion, I don't think it adds context. And I kind of come back to the question of context in a moment. So these uh, images, all taken on the Antrim coast, um, you recognize Giant's Causeway, I hope, on the top, um, are um, very much uh, shots that don't really have a focal point. They are scenic views. They don't have a clear reason, apart from being there, clear focus for the picture. But it's more about, be, uh, more about the light, the landscape profile, and everything about them. It's, it's, it's something there without having a clear single focal point. So don't feel as though your pictures need to have a focal point because they don't. Um, this is just an example where um, my original shot, taken in Shropshire, um, a place called Hope Bodler Hill. It's a lovely spot if you've not been there. Um, original shot had a tree in it. And I thought, okay, put a tree in the picture, focal point for the picture. But actually the crop version at the top with the tree removed, uh, in my mind, is a much stronger picture because it draws the eye towards the, uh, the mist in the fields, the colouring and the field pattern. So it doesn't take your eye away like the tree does. So uh, just an example where using the focal point can detract. Conversely, the focal point can probably add as well. Two examples taken in Glencoe, one with the light falling on the bridge, the other um, using uh, just with no focal points, just drawing the eye to the mountain. Um, I think I'd far prefer the one with the bridge in this case. The first one, nice view, but something needs to draw the eye. And the mountain, perhaps in shade, doesn't quite do that. Also on drawing attention to your subject, framing. Something I rarely use in landscape photography, in truth. Uh, can usually add clutter and usually the overhanging tree branch effect rarely works. Um, 
it, it can add complex visual clutter, which to a lot, what can often bar, be quite a simple image. So use with care. Uh, one of my most successful framing ex uh, examples is probably the shot on the right hand side taken in Hong Kong. It's the Bank of China building, but it's an architectural shot. It's got a different structure, different purpose than a landscape shot. So I find landscape photography and framing uh, quite difficult. Uh, but of course, that's a generalization. You might find plenty of examples that work for you. And um, something else that I use to draw your eye to the subject as well is vignetting. Uh, so this one effectively uh, has all the dark tones in the image around the edge and all the lighter tones in the uh, center. Um, so it draws your eye into the frame and onto the subject that you're photographing. So this is a combination usually of natural light, uh, where the light lighting hits the landscape, um, the uh, use often of a graduated filter, certainly with the one at the top, and potentially putting a graduation on post-processing, and also post-processing vignetting as well. So it's, it's the composition originally, and the positioning of the subject, it's, and it's what we do with controlling light. It's the key to this and it draws your eye into the frame something I use quite a lot and what a lot of, what I often do as well is darken the foreground deeper the foreground tones because it draws your eye into the shot um, using leading lines here I've just got a series of thick uh, pictures that draw your eye into the frame so what these do is create depth so they don't necessarily draw attention to your subject, although they can contrib contribute, but they create depth in the picture by taking your eye through it. So I've got exa a few examples of a meandering line, straight lines with those, the, 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 the backlighting of the trees, um, and the meandering, meandering river. So all these are, are, are take your eye through the picture, so they create depth. Other more di very direct examples. So these are much stronger lines. So whether it's Dirtle Door, a waterfall, or, or a sculpture, all of these, man-made or natural, take your eye into the picture. So again, they they create depth in the picture, taking your eye, taking your eye through it. We can also create depth by emphasizing foreground. So in my mind, two key things about foreground. One, keep it simple. Um, very strong, very simple. Um, complex, cluttered foregrounds tend to detract. Um, and all what they're doing is effectively is creating a setting for your subject. Take your eye into, into, the, into the frame. Um, so two, uh, three examples here. The height you take the picture from is also key. Um, and I experiment quite a lot with precise positioning. Lower down, higher up. Um, just changing the emphasis of the shot a little bit. Um, the higher up you go, the less, less emphasis on the foreground, and the more you're spreading the picture out, which you might want to do, and I'll explain more about next, next, that next week when I go into uh, the use of natural light, because then I do use higher viewpoints quite a lot. But these, if you want to emphasize foreground, generally going to be using a lower, uh, a lower viewpoint. These ones, same principle. Um, strong foreground um, and creating depth in the, in, in the frame. These are all portrait format. Portrait format is very good for strong, simple compositions because you get a closer relationship between what's close to the camera and what's further away. In other words, the foreground and background than you do in landscape format. Landscape formats has more context to it. You get more of a wider view. But if you want a distinctive relationship between one and the other, try using portrait format. And it's a good thing to practice. Go out with one lens. Wide angle lens typically will do this uh, well. And look for a simple foreground against a single background feature. It does help practice uh, simple composition. Um, these are just a uh, range of very similar views taken on the Snowdon Ridge um, in, in Snowdonia, needless to say. Um, so uh, where I had a little bit of a practice with the positioning of the foreground, uh, the main feature on the right uh, or in the center or on the left-hand side. Um, and it could be because we read from left to right, at least we do in the English language anyway. Um, and, uh, but I tend to prefer the ones where um, I main feature, the main feature is on the left hand side and um, uh, it takes your eye into the picture on the right. The others to me, the ones at the top look less comfortable. Um, so 
Uh, it could be down to personal preference, but I think most people tend to, would tend to, tend to agree with that. So it is a question of experimentation. Elevated viewpoints. Now with these, foreground isn't actually an issue. What you're doing is creating depth through use of light. So here, the light in the distance is catching the eye. It's drawing your eye into the frame simply by using an, um, an elevated viewpoint. And in these cases, these are just examples where I wouldn't want the light in the foreground because this would instantly take that, depth, that feeling of depth away from the shot. So a lot of my favorite shots are, are of this type, usually shot against the light. Again, it's something I'm gonna be talking uh, more about uh, next week. A couple of examples taken at uh, Clint Cluedoc in uh, Mid Wales. Um, first one, the whole landscape is lit. So you get an overall impression. The eye doesn't really rest on any particular part of the picture. The dam does catch the eye because it's a lighter tone. But apart from that, it generates an overall effect. The one at the bottom, the light is just on the background. You can see the emphasis is very much on that single hill. It draws your eye into the shot so much more. So no wrong or right about it, and I should emphasize with all of these things, there's never any wrong or right about it, or generally, it's the effect that you're aiming to achieve from your picture. Um, placing a main feature. This is the third key element to me. It's creating space and using a main, placing a main feature. I think we've all heard of the rule of thirds. Um, I don't like to think of it as a rule. It's very much a guideline to use as and when. But effectively, what you're doing with the thirds is creating context. So if you've got a strong single main feature, main subject in your frame, then um, it's where you position it in the frame. Imagine your frame as a no uh, the old uh, noughts and crosses board, the game that you had to be useless to, use to, useless to, uh, to lose. Um, I shouldn't have tried saying that. Um, and uh, if you put it in the middle, your eye is drawn straight to it and stops there. If you put it on the third, your eye explores the frame. So effectively, you're using a subject as a starting point, and that starting point creates, it has got a context, it's background. So uh, where you put this subject is quite key to the effect that you want. So these are examples you, where I've used the thirds. However, I use the center of the frame a lot, because if you use the center of the frame, your eye is drawn to the subject, and therefore your main subject has more impact in the frame. Um, it doesn't tend to explore the rest of the frame as much. So think about what impact you, have, uh, you want your main subject to have. Do you want it to have context, em to emphasize rather, context, or do you want to, want to emphasize the subject to yourself? And that might determine where you put the main subject in the frame. These examples have used the principle of the thirds, but uh, the subject is closer to the edge of the frame because I wanted to create a feeling of space with all these, whether it's the night sky, whether it's the drama of the sky with a tree, or the feeling of isolation of the bridge, or any one of them, then I've put the main subject much closer to the edge of the frame because that, that's the emphasis I wanted to achieve. The one at the bottom right, I wanted the gray to dominate the picture. If I'd used the, um, the grass or the, 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 the all seed rape, the yellow, any higher, the yellow would have dominated. And I want the weight of the picture to be on, on, the, on the sky. So again, it comes down to the effect that I wanted from the picture. Um, the shape of the picture, again, um, and whether you're creating space or not, format and cropping. Um, most of our pictures have got a starting point of three by two or four by three, depending on the format of the camera. Um, but think about what you want from your picture and the format which is going to be most suitable for it. So I've got a few examples there, portrait format, uh, square format and panoramic uh, format, uh, which emphasize the effect I want to achieve much more strongly. So all these are either stitched images, the one at the top, or crops of a single image. A couple more examples here where I've got the original three by twos, turn it to square format. So it changes the emphasis. Uh, for a long time, actually, the one at the bottom I used as the, uh, the landscape uh, version three by two. And actually the square format has actually got, got a, 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 almost a, um, uh, a symmetry about it, which is quite, quite interesting. So I quite like the square one too. Other examples here uh, between um, landscape format and portrait format you can see that the portrait format has that relationship 
uh, between foreground and background, but doesn't create a feeling of space and context. So think about what's important to your shot. Maybe both are, maybe one is, but think about choosing uh, which you want. And the, the, the secret is to experiment actually. And I, normally I end up taking a wide variety of pictures and then often it isn't until afterwards I think actually that's the wanted, that, that really emphasizes what I wanted to achieve. Um, a shot which I've used a number of times before, but it shows also an original of it. It's not the same original because uh, I lost my original raw file of top one, unfortunately. Uh, but I went back to take it a few years later. You can see the trees have grown up quite a lot. Um, but you can see the surroundings, uh, hillside, farm, lots of other trees, um, effectively detract from the reason I took the picture. So the crop is much simpler, focusing the eye on the backlighting of the trees and the line of the trees running across the frame. Um, so cropping there drew the eye on, on the, the key elements of the picture. Likewise, um, the field pattern and the farm in it is completely lost in the bottom picture. Uh, the top one is just a telephoto shot um, of just a part of the frame, which draws the eye much more towards the, the field pattern than just a generic view. This one's quite interesting. And in fact, the bottom one is a crop of the top one uh, because I didn't take a, a close-up shot, but it's actually got a quite interesting field pattern to it. Just that lit bit. So you've got the wider, wider shot there, which I've shown you before, but just that lit area is quite an interesting shot in its own right. Uh, forgot to take it, but um, the advantage of having a, quite a high resolution camera, you can do things like that. Although I wouldn't want to print, print that up too large, to be honest with you. Finally, on this section, uh, just a few uh, shots which uh, don't really comply to any rules, uh, but they are effective simply because um, they uh, the use of light. So these are all taken on the Isle of Skye, uh, one of my favourite places. Um, they wouldn't really, def whether you're using foreground, they don't you really use the thirds, they don't really use anything in particular, but they just happen to have caught a moment of light. So don't get hung up over over uh, compositional rules um, because ultimately um, think about the effect that you want from your picture think about what brings that the uh, uh, brings out that effect and compose the picture according to what you want from it what i would say with these they do on the whole on the whole not totally contain the highlights in the frame if you look at most of these and it's something i only recently observed really that most of my surroundings are darker and I try to keep the eye drawn into the picture by holding the highlights within the frame. That's not the case in the one on the bottom right, of course. Uh, so it's not entirely the case, but more often than not, it's what I tend to do. Finally, um, a few case studies. So I didn't go through this last week, so um, I have run through it a little bit quicker. I'll just briefly run through these. Um, these ones taken on Corf, uh, Corf Castle um, in uh, Dorset. Uh, just a uh, exploring with a foreground. Top one, not really any thought given to it at all. Bit of a snap, uh, frost on the ground. And then thinking about how can I use, find a foreground which draws your eye into the frame and acts as a setting for the, uh, a, a, a base for the picture. And the one I preferred most is where I think the light caught part of the picture, but not all of it. So it's particularly the clump of grass in the foreground there. Um, so, um, and the, the grasses are structured in a way that draw your eye into, into the frame. Next one. Um, taking the Brecon Beacons. Um, two not very good effects at the top, which don't work at all. <laughs> you have not to use a lead in line. Um, and uh, finally, I, I got to one where I liked the balance of it. So I've got the light on the, on the frosted grass spread throughout the whole of the foreground. So it keeps that idea of using a simple, consistent foreground. Uh, used a low viewpoint, which places emphasis on the foreground. And the other thing which I didn't take into account when I took this, and I should have done. Um, 10 minutes later, the light wasn't on any of that grass, so the whole lot was in shadow. 10 minutes, sorry, 10 minutes earlier, I beg your pardon, uh, it was all in shadow. 10 minutes later, it was all lit, and of course, very quickly, the, the, the frost can melt as well. Um, so timing is quite important for this kind of shot, because what makes it, uh, what makes the grass stand out, of course, is the fact that the grass is, the grass is lit, and everything else is in shadow. So um, timing, again, is important as well. 
Um, a few examples taken on the Jurassic Coast. Um, I the square format for me works most strongly. Um, the uh, landform takes your eye into the landscape very well, so I can't take credit for the land score landform. The one at the bottom, I, I've moved shifted position slightly because I wanted the emphasis to be on the, the stars and the sky, but compositionally the foreground doesn't work as well for that reason. So it changes the emphasis of the shot. A few examples taken on um, the Giants Causeway in County Antrim. Um, so the effect of the shot I prefer is the one, the black and white one on the bottom right hand side, bottom left hand side. Um, because I like that tonal effect on the on the causeway. I don't particularly like the composition, however, because I don't like the way that the uh, causeway itself cuts into the cuts in, into the simplicity of the sky and the water, um, which the others I've positioned myself in a place where I've got a base for the picture draws your eye in. So visually, I like the black and white one at the bottom, but compositionally, probably the one at the top left to me works best. But that's just my view, of course. Doesn't make it right. Um, cropping, just a few examples taken on. Uh, this is not County Antrim. This is the Isle of Sky, so ignore the uh, few one or two glitches I still need to uh, to uh, address. Uh, so a few examples: the original shot, uh, a square format, and a portrait format. Uh, the square format, to me, gives me the right balance. But this one's quite subtle. Something which is quite. Uh, Lots of you will know, but it's dead difficult to photograph. Iron Bridge, um, so desperately tried to find some foreground. Horrible attempt at the top left. Um, <laughs> tried to find a couple of flowers as well, but I found the interesting one was one, a composition I use quite a lot, using a strong diagonal, drawing your eye up into the picture from underneath. So think about using creative views as well. As I say, go to Iron Bridge and you'll find out how tricky it is to photograph it. Um, my all sea rape tree, uh, uh, field tree, um, just a few others. A um, couple of shots on approaching it with the approaching changing sky, sky gradually darkened, finally got the, the effect I want. So a question of waiting my moment here. And the key thing about this one, tree positioned in the middle because it draws the eye towards the tree and the weight of the picture on the gray, think of it as two colors, gray and yellow, um, and the weight of the picture on the grey, therefore a very low horizon line used for it. Um, simple, uh, whoa, that shouldn't be there, I need to remove that because that belongs in different presentations. Sorry about that. Um, exploring a feature um, and uh, a sculpture called The Guardian in the South Wales Valleys, uh, just different views, a wide view, looking down from, from below, looking up from underneath, um, and um, uh, yeah, just a variety of views really. Just experiment with close-ups, distant views, context, scale, all those kind of things. Um, using a wide shot or a telephoto, a uh, couple of examples here. One using uh, that shot I showed you earlier on with the reflection, but also a telephoto version as well. The shot which doesn't really work, I find, Similar shot taken on a bright day, the wide view, the sky does nothing. The sky and the reflection of the water does nothing. But compare that to the one at the bottom, the gray works really well. So um, you can see the um, different emphasis of the picture. So those were just a few examples at the end. Um, just a few key points, really. Explore your subject and try and see a picture and everything. Um, the question about effect of a composition of rule rather than following it is important. Um, I think I've emphasized, hopefully I've emphasized that. Um, experiment with your point of view, but remember ultimately it's your picture, but think about what the effect that, the effect that you want from your picture, not what you expect perhaps others, others to see. And think about why am I taking this picture? It's a fundamental question. So um, finally, there's my Contact details. So uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, managed to go through it in a, a little bit less than an hour. So hopefully it's hopefully it's useful.